think of as a rising star. So she recently received the NSF Career Award, and she was named one of the 40 under 40 by Crane's Chicago Business. So her PhD is in robotics from Carnegie Mellon, and prior to that, she was a postdoc in France, and then she also spent some time at the NIH. So please join me in welcoming Brenna. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to be here to speak. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, I am both faculty at Northwestern and I'm, um, I direct a, a lab at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, RIC is a rehabilitation hospital. Um, it's been ranked the number one rehab hospital um, by World and News Report for 26 consecutive years. And we treat a variety of impairments at RIC, um, primarily motor, but also brain injury that results in motor impairment. We, do, we don't do too much with like sensory impairments, though we're starting to change that. Um, now, when I came to RIC five years ago, I was coming from a background in robotics autonomy. I hadn't, didn't have any experience with assistive or rehabilitation domains at all. Um, and so my, my first um, objective was to figure out where there was an opportunity for autonomy to make impact within this domain. And it became clear pretty quickly that within the field of rehabilitation, um, we make heavy use of assistive machines and that many of these machines are difficult, difficult to control um, by the people who they were designed to um, help. So probably the most ubiquitous assistive machine is the powered wheelchair. This is a two-dimensional control problem, so you control heading and you control speed. So if you have upper arm function and you can control a two-axis joystick, this, um, the wheelchair, that fully covers the control space of the wheelchair, and the wheelchair very quickly will become an extension of a, the person's own body and mobility. Now, if we try to use that same sort of interface in order to operate a robotic arm, now the machine has gotten much more complex. So a robotic arm, just to position the, the, the end of the robotic arm, the end effector of the robotic arm, not even to operate the hand or gripper, just to position it is a six-dimensional control problem. So you have to specify position in 3D and orientation in 3D. So already our two-axis joystick only covers a fraction of that control space. Um, you can see that this individual is actually using um, his foot, that's that insert on the upper left, he's actually using his foot to operate the joystick because of course many of the people who would benefit from the use of a robotic arm don't have the use of their hand to operate a regular joystick. Um, so this story gets only more, um, more challenging as we introduce more limited control interfaces. So if we think of the control interfaces that are available commercially to drive powered wheelchairs, um, when someone do does not have the, uh, the upper arm mobility to be able to operate a joystick, we have things like the head array, um, head array, which is switches embedded in a headrest, or a sip and puff. And what these issue are 1D discrete control signals. So it's like turning on a switch in one dimension at a time. So if you are using that to operate a power wheelchair, you can still operate half of the control space at a given time. So it's reasonable. It's more difficult, but it's reasonable. Trying to use these kind of interfaces to now operate things like robotic arms is pretty much untenable. And so this is an opportunity for robotics autonomy. If we introduce the kind of autonomy technologies that we're starting to see, for example, on driverless cars, and we make these machines able to control themselves um, and share control with the human, then hopefully we should increase access um, and also just make it less burdensome to actually operate in the first place. Okay, so just to sort of recap these control challenges really quickly. So first, we have, the, we have, we have these limited interfaces. The more motor impaired someone gets, uh, the opportunities to actually collect control signals from them become lower bandwidth and um, lower dimensional. They're just more difficult. They, they encode less information uh, succinctly. Um, we also have mo motor impairments. So regardless of the interface being used, the actual motor impairments of the person will, uh, in some sense, sort of mask or filter their true motor intent. Um, and of course, what we're trying to do is figure out what they actually want to be doing. Also machine complexity. So as machines get more complex, they also get more complex to control, which means they typically are more difficult to control. And um, the sort of paradox that's paired with that is that typically if you have a more complex machine, it's because you have lower impairment. That's why you need the additional complexity of assistance. And so the question is how do you control, control this? Okay, so we turn assistive machines, in my lab we turn assistive machines into um, autonomous assistive robots that share control with humans, so really semi-autonomous. Um, and the way to do that is you start with your assistive machine. At a very high level, you need to add on sensors so that it can detect the world around, to it, around it and react to that. This is especially critical in human environments, which are very dynamic. Um, you also have to add on some computing and artificial intelligence to reason about what it is that you've sensed, 
We also reason about the control inputs that are coming from the human. Um, and then you, from that, you figure out what kind of control command to send to this assistive machine. And so then it's turned into an assistive robot. Now, of course, the devil's in the details, and actually the computing AI segment is really where the majority of research needs to be going in. So these are the platforms that we have in my lab. Um, we started out with a robotic wheelchair all the way on the left, which you'll notice doesn't ha didn't have a seat. So the base was the same as a powered wheelchair, but it didn't have a seat. So that was really a development platform. We couldn't really do user studies with that. Um, about almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, we got an, a second powered wheelchair that now has a seat. We ported the technology from the first chair to the second chair, um, and we started being able to do user studies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, uh, later in the talk. We also um, work with assistive robotic arms. So we have the Miko robotic arm, which is from Canova Robotics, um, whom many of you are probably familiar. This is a robotics company in Canada that's created, that designed the Jayco, which is sort of the rehabilitation sibling of the Miko, um, in order to be mounted to powered wheelchairs specifically. So this is now a robot that was designed intentionally, a robotic arm that was designed intentionally to um, fit uh, on, to fit, be mounted right onto a powered wheelchair without really increasing its footprint and was designed to be able to be operated you know, right next to someone's head and be safe and still functional and things like that. Um, and then on the right there, that's an arm that is um, sort of a custom arm that is a collaboration with some researchers in Italy that I don't have time to talk about, but I'm happy to. It, it's a really neat platform, but we're still figuring out how to control it. Okay. So I mentioned these control challenges earlier. Of course, there's an additional control challenge um, that I didn't mention. And that's the fact that every user has both unique and non-static abilities. So their, their abilities and their preferences are unique because every person is different. Their impairment is different um, and their personal preferences are different. Um, the non-static abilities is because people are changing. We know that they're gonna be changing. You know, hopefully it's because they're in rehabilitation, they're regaining ability. But of course, the reality of our domain is that they might have degenerative diseases and be losing ability. Um, certainly as people age, they lose muscle tone. And so if you already started out with an impairment, um, it becomes a motor impairment, it becomes just exaggerated. Um, and so, and, and if we think about this from the standpoint of assistance, that we wanna modulate the amount of assistance we're providing based on people's needs at a given time, then we can even consider things like fatigue and pain, that this might be something that's actually changing throughout the day. Um, and a good, uh, or if we do our job correctly, we should be responsive to this. So the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about customization. Um, and that's really about customizing this autonomy to the given person, uh, given person. So with the wheelchair platform we've been developing, we've focused on customization for all the um, uh, reasons I mentioned earlier, and we also are uh, focusing on low cost. And the reason why is that we don't expect that this is going to be covered by insurance anytime soon in the future. And when a wheelchair, when a therapist fits a patient for a wheelchair, they actually fill out, in the United States, they fill out a stack of insurance forms this thick to justify every seating cushion, um, choice, everything. And so our end goal, of course, is for autonomy to be on that insurance uh, packet that you would be able to say with this kind of impairment and this kind of ability and these kind of needs, they need this kind of sen these kind of sensors and this kind of software. But that's gonna take a long time. Um, realistically, it's gonna take a long time. So we want what we designed to be financeable out of pocket for at least a majority of the population. So something that's like the cost of a laptop, something like that. So one way that we accomplish um, customization is by having a modular software architecture. And what we do is we allow people to opt into or out of any number of these modules. So they don't have to be participating in all different forms of um, assistance. They can choose what they want help with. Um, we also have modular hardware, and this is to in part keep costs down as well. So we assume that we um, are provided a wheelchair and a control interface. We don't focus on custom interfaces, not because there isn't work to be done there, but because the ones that are exec existing and commercially deployed are already accepted, and it's just one less thing that we need to get the user to adopt in order to adopt our technology. Um, the idea is also that if we can do a good job, you know, with these sort of suboptimal control signals, we can we would only do a better job, presumably, with better control signals. Um, and then we add on sensors. So we ha we have what we add on are computing power and electronics. Um, power actually we run off of the battery, but we have to have an inverter to do that. And then um, the sensor. So our base sensor is to use one RGBD sensor. We're using the Asus XDion, but you know the Microsoft Connect is another example. Um, and then if you add on additional sensors, you add on additional cost, but you also add on more robustness. And it might be that some of those behaviors that we saw in the previous slide are only um, able to be unlocked if you have the right kind of sensor technology, for example. Um, 
we use, we pipe right into the wheelchair's control, um, the, like the proprietary control chain of the wheelchair. So there are actually these interfaces. Um, one of them is called the Omni, that's what we use. But there, there basically have been these interface modules developed so that you could use third-party custom add-on um, add-on interfaces to control these wheelchairs. It's pretty much all the major wheelchair manufacturers from like their midline and top line and it should be, you know, in future generations it will also be the low line. Um, and so basically they have this option when you buy this control module you can just tap directly into it. So what we do in my system is that, or in my lab system, is that we actually just emulate joystick voltages. And so it still gets executed by the proprietary wheel wheelchair control. We have no idea if this avoids the warranty or not, but um, the, idea, the idea is that, um, is that, again, we didn't need to sort of like reverse engineer how their signal, their like packet transferring is and things like that. So, okay, another way that we accomplish um, customization is in the way that we share control with the user. So for any given one of these like software modules, how you actually transfer control between the human and the robot or you share blend control between them it's a question, it's an open research question, and there's many different ways to do this. So in the equation I have right there, that's just a very simple example of a linear blending function, right? Where we have a control signal coming from the user on the left, and a control signal coming from the robot on the right, and we just have this linear factor alpha that's going to blend um, the two of them together. Um, but there's many other different ways you could do control sharing as well. And so the second part of my talk is going to talk about sharing control between assistive robots and humans, and I think that this is actually gonna be really the crux of getting these kind of technologies adopted in general society. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to provide assistance, and I'm just gonna step you through some of the design decisions that are made in coming up with uh, these autonomy systems for a robotic wheelchair um, in my lab, just so you can see how many sort of arbitrary engineering decisions are being made at any given time. So if we start out here, this in, in this picture, the green outline is the footprint of the wheelchair robot. Um, the red arrow is the current command coming from the user, the velocity command coming from the user. The box is an obstacle, and the gap in the line across the top is a doorway. So the first thing that we need to figure out is what it is the robot's trying to, or the human's trying to do. Because for all robotics autonomy packages, if we're going to, like for example, plan a path, you need a goal. You need somewhere that you're planning to. Um, so one way that we have this implemented is just to do a very simple forward projection of like a half a, into, a half a second into the future of the current control command. And so we're making very few assumptions about what it is the user's trying to do besides what they actually just currently instructed the robot to do. Of course, we can also do higher level perception algorithms as well though, um, like uh, that are able, for example, to detect doorways. And actually we have perception algorithms running on this wheelchair that, that can detect doorways, that can detect places to dock at um, desks and tables, and also that can detect ramps. Um, and so this is just a different, whether or not this, this would allow the robot to provide sort of more assistance, longer term assistance, <coughs> but it also might get the inference of what the human's trying to do wrong, and it might sometimes choose the wrong goal, and so these are all things that need to be considered, and that different people might have different preferences on how they want this to look. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so if, if we now have multiple options for how to actually, um, to, of which are the possible goals, we need to choose between them. So here is a video, if you watch my thumb, I'm teleoperating the robot and I'm just telling it to go straight. And when I first stop, it doesn't do anything because it can't tell which door I'm trying to go through. But once I give a bit of a signal to the left, then it knows that I want the left door and it infers that. And then in this particular blending paradigm, it goes through com uh, completely autonomously once it's very confident that it knows what the humans wants to, wants to do. Um, so that's one, one way we have that implemented in our system. Okay, so now we have our goal. The next thing we do is we send that goal to an autonomous path planner. And the, the control command that comes from the path planner is the blue arrow. So now we've got two signals, and so we need to figure out what to do between them. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that. So one way that we've implemented it, um, and the, all of these ways were actually taken from the literature or inspired by the literature. They are not a comp comprehensive coverage of it, but these are used a lot within the smart wheelchair literature. Um, so we definitely, within the literature, don't see consensus on how to share control either. Um, so one way is to just sort of like cap the executed command, and that's the purple arrow, to be no greater than um, what was provided the by the autonomy. Another way is to sort of blend. So this would be that linear blending um, equation that you saw in my earlier slide, to somehow have a blend of these two, and we, we also check that like the blended command um, is safe, is it not going to run into the obstacle. Um, now, of course, 
Oh, and so this is, an, this is an example of what the blending looks like. So again, watch my thumb, and I'm trying to drive directly into the chair. And you'll see that the robot kind of infers that it should go around. Um, but then once things are safe, it just gives control completely back. So we sort of step this. On the left there is that blending factor alpha. And so what the colors are showing is basically what is the percentage of control that lies with the human versus the autonomy when we're blending these two control signals. And you can see as we're getting closer and closer to the obstacle, it's getting to the point where the human basically doesn't have any control because they're trying to drive into the obstacle. But then once they've been sort of like safely turned, they get that control completely. And we just have this running all the time uh, on our robot. Okay. Now, of course, we can do the same thing, but now with this higher level goal. And you can see that actually what the robot would have you try to do is very different if it thought you were trying to go to a different goal. Um, and then we can do something that's even a little bit more aggressive, and this is what you saw in the decision between the doorways uh, video, is that once we're very, very confident on what you want to do, if the person sa stops giving a signal, we take that as a cue to just go through autonomously. Now, you can imagine another interpretation is that no signal means stop. And so this again, these again are just different design decisions. So these are four different ways to perform control sharing um, that we have implemented on our, uh, on the robot in my arm, or in my lab. And here's what they look like as videos. So here, this is someone with a spinal cord injury. They are using a joystick with a modified sort of T-bar to drive um, the chair. And I, I think I took out the videos that actually showed what it was like without the assistance. Um, and it, it's definitely much slower. But what you'll notice actually, or what maybe, maybe you noticed, is that these don't actually look that different from each other. So, and, and they also don't look that different from each other when we analyze them according to the sort of typical metrics we, we would use in robotics. So if we look at like completion time or number of collisions, they're pretty equivalent. And I think this might be why in these systems we've tended to just see that they choose, the engineers choose one and then that's, that's there because they seem relatively equivalent. The thing is, is that people can feel a difference and they have a clear preference between them. So what we haven't actually seen much in the robotic wheelchair literature is a comparison between these multiple different ways to share control, really within um, assistive autonomous robotics in general. Um, so that's a study that my lab did recently over the last year. Um, so we had five different control paradigms. So it was the four I just showed you and then also just um, direct teleoperation, so no autonomy. Um, we had two different interfaces, so we wanted to see if people's performance and preference changed with the type of interface they were using. So if you were now using the head array, which was the other interface we used, which is much more limited and difficult, um, did this change what kind of assistance you wanted? And um, we initially planned to do it in two sessions, and that's what it was for the majority of subjects. Some of our spinal cord injured subjects, actually because of their sitting tolerance, we had to break a session into two. So it was two to four sessions. Um, and because we wanted to see if we started to see anything with res uh, respect to like familiarization and learning. And that's actually probably the next step with this project is to do something that's really long term to look at learning, learning effects with um, control sharing paradigm uh, preference. And then we had seven spinal cord injured subjects and seven <coughs> uninjured subjects. Um, and we were doing just a doorway traversal task. So I should highlight that this study didn't actually do any of the sort of trying to pick between multiple goals, right? We took that up part out of it. And I do expect that that would actually change people's preferences um, because sometimes it might pick the wrong goal. And in that case, they might want less autonomy. So these, even these results, I, I'd say, um, are limited in how far they generalize. So this, is just a, this, this work is actually currently under review. So this is just a sneak peek of the results. Um, but what we saw was that no single control paradigm was universally preferred or universally not preferred amongst all subjects. So what we did is we asked people to indicate their most preferred paradigm for each interface. We asked them to, show their, to choose their most preferred para paradigm and their least preferred. And we um, allowed them to have ties, as many ties as they wanted. So it could have been that they said actually everything was least preferred, um, but we didn't see that. Um, what we saw was that every single paradigm was chosen at least once as most preferred and as, most, as least preferred by some subject. Um, and we, we definitely saw no like, statistically significant difference in performance between any of them across all subjects. Um, we did sort of see one clear loser just in how infrequently it was chosen as most, um, as most preferred and, as le and how frequently it was chosen as least preferred. So we did see sort of trends of distributions and certainly filtering seems to be not preferred in general. But some people did, did want it, right? Um, Okay, what we did see is that both performance and preference changed with the control interface. So 50% of the time, I believe, um, we had people changing which control paradigm they liked when they changed w with a different um, interface. 
Um, and we also saw this um, across, across sessions. So we did start to see some learning and familiarization effects, but that's super preliminary, so can't really even comment beyond that. But what we did see is that actually um, preference switched across sessions, so that as people became more familiar with the autonomy, they actually selected a different one as their most preferred about half the time. Um, the, yeah, um, about half the time overall. Um, and we saw a few differences between the subject groups actually. So between spinal cord injured and injured groups, we saw a little bit of, you can visually sort of eyeball that the distributions of preference are shifted somewhat, but um, we saw very few statistically significant differences. Um, so basically what this is telling us is that we should provide options. I don't think this is telling us anything definitive about whether or not a given control paradigm is like better um, or best or most preferred or anything like that. What this is telling us is that there is a distribution over people and that to meet their needs and meet their preferences, we should be providing a distribution or a variety of, of paradigms. Um, and then um, another thing that my postdoc, this is also under review, but we, we also took a stab at actually trying to model preference as a function of computable metrics. And so we were trying to see if we could predict what their preferred paradigm was going to be based on some computable performance metrics. Um, and uh, we were able to do that somewhat well, I think at about like 80% accuracy. So we're capturing something, but we can't capture all of it. Okay, so I just talked about different sort of functions that we could have to represent control sharing. Of course, each of these functions, however, are parameterized, and these parameterizations can also be customized to a given person. So that is a study that we did with our robotic arm. Um, so we were using, this was an exploratory study, so it only had four um, spinal cord injured subjects and had 13 un uninjured subjects. Um, and what we were doing is we were looking at customizing this function that was arbitrating between the human's control, um, control signal and the robot's. So that factor alpha we've seen before, so basically as alpha goes up to one, all the controls with the autonomy, and as um, when it's zero, all controls with the human. And along the x-axis we have this sort of our confidence that we've been able to figure out what the human's trying to do. So the idea is that as the system is more confident that it knows what the human's trying to do, it helps out more. Um, this already is a simplification and assumption um, because of course, just because, a per just because you can really tell what a person's trying to do doesn't necessarily mean, mean that they want help with it, right? And so, but this is a reasonable place to start and this is where a lot of the literature has started too. So, of course, this is parameterized by three um, parameters. So it's at, the, at what point do we start providing assistance? How quickly do we provide assistance or provide more assistance? And also, once we're very, very confident, um, how much control is left with the human? So is alpha just at like 60% when it max out, maxes out or is it all the way at one? Um, and so what we did in this study is we actually allowed people to take a hand at customizing this function themselves. So um, again, it was exploratory and we just had them give us verbal feedback. So if they said things like, we wanted the autonomy to take control sooner, we know which parameter to shift, or we wanted it to take control faster or not as fast, things like that. And so we, um, we let them have sort of a go at customizing it themselves. Um, so this is what it looks like. So here's what it looks like under teleoperation. Um, you'll notice actually that right now, so right here, so because this is, he's teleoperating with um, the joystick, I think he could do twists, so he's do, able to issue three control dimensions at a time. So of course, the actual arm is six dimensional control, so you have to toggle between these different control modes. You do that with a button press. However, he does not have <coughs> hand function for a button press. And I should say, you do that with a button press with the commercial product. Um, and he does not have the hand function for that, so we actually have a utility cup in his hand with a pen in it, and that's how he's performing the mode switches. So you can see he switches between a different mode, and then now he's gonna start operating that mo mode and then realize he's not in the mode that he thought he was. And this is another big problem, is that if you have this sort of like line of con or linear um, composition of these control modes, you have to remember actually how many clicks is it to get to the mode that I want, um, which is also challenging. And then on the bottom here, this is what it looked like when he was using a customization function that he customized himself. So one thing you'll notice is actually there's no mode switches. And the reason why is because we started out in a control mode that was informative about intent. So if I had two objects in front of here, me here, and I'm able to, I'm in a control mode that allows me to translate in this dimension, I get a lot of information about what object you're going for, right? But if, for example, I started out in a control mode that was doing orientation like this, I wouldn't get any information. And so that's actually um, a follow-on study that my student Deepak is doing is figuring, is seeing if we can actually sort of like anticipatory, like switch into um, a control mode that's sort of um, 
anticipates, uh, or like it would be ma maximally disambiguating. Um, so it's kind of like a help me help you, that if you're willing to operate in this control mode for a little bit, I'm gonna get a better idea faster what you're trying to do and I can provide help sooner. Um, okay, so some results from this study. One thing that we found was really interesting is that for, so we, we, what we did was we had um, data from teleoperations and no assistance. We had sort of a minimal amount of assistance and a maximal amount of assistance. And then the customized assistance was some pla place in between the two or equal. It could be all the way at min or all the way at max. And um, what we saw was statistically significant differences between spinal cord injured subjects and uninjured subjects. Um, and this is with respect to task completion time. And we saw that for every paradigm except custom. So even when we were providing the maximum amount of assistance, if you had asked me beforehand, I would have thought that that is what would have normalized people the most because there's the most contribution, their, their signal is um, playing the least contribution, right? And so the, if we think the, the differences between uninjured and spinal cord injured subjects comes through in their signals, so if the majority of the signal is coming from the autonomy, then there isn't as much of a difference between the two subject groups operating. And that's not what we found. So we, we did see that our statistically significant differences became less significant um, with max, but they only were eliminated with custom. Now this is not statistically e equivalent, but it's no longer statistically different. Um, and so this is telling us that the subjects have some sort of insight about how they are interfacing with the autonomy and with the, with the system. Um, and that they can, they have an intuition for how to do it the best and the five. Um, we also saw that spinal cord injured subjects uh, customized for more assistance and uninjured for less assistance. Um, and so this is actually that we allowed for two customization rounds. And so it was whether or not for the second customization round they went up or down. Um, one thing that's, uh, that was interesting is that if we looked at these sort of um, customized or these sort of assistance paradigms and we looked at them from the standpoint of metrics that we typically would op use to optimize control policies in robotics, so like time minimization, we did effort minimization, we measured that um, as the number of mode switches, we used that as an approximation for effort, and if we only look at those measures, we can't explain the customization. So, Seven of 34 customizations had greater task completion time, and 14 of 34 had more mode switches. So this is that someone is opting to go slower or opting to have more mode switches. Um, and even if we look at the two combined, we can't explain it all, which is also telling us that human preference is taking the form of something other than what we would typically be optimizing um, just within the field of robotics. Okay, so the last bit that I'm gonna go through really quickly is robot learning and human learning. So of course, with this sort of, um, with, the, with this sort of ad, adaptive assistance, what we ideally would want to do is be able to provide it on the fly, to be able to detect certain things or get certain feedback from the user and be able to modify it. Um, what this looks like is actually robot learning from motor impaired teachers. So my prior work during my postdoc and dissertation was all about robot learning from demonstration. Um, and a lot of this domain basically is robot learning from demonstration, but where the demonstrator, the teacher, is now motor impaired. Um, for any machine learning algorithm, you need some sort of a feedback signal. Oops, sorry. Um, so there are two big questions in my mind with, with, um, that we need to answer with this domain. So these are videos from my postdoc at EPFL. Um, and you can see here on the right that this is that I'm trying to uh, uh, define sort of an initial movement for the robot, which we expect people are going to want to do, right? They're going to have new things that they want the robot to do once they have it out in their daily lives. And because that the robot arm is a 15 degree freedom arm, the only way I could control it was by outfitting my own arm with a bunch of sensors and mapping those directly to teleoperate the robot. Um, that's not gonna be an option, right? We, we know that we're going to be actually constrained to these limited interfaces. And so what does actually machine learning look like in that context? Um, and also this, this idea of adaptation. So there we were sort of adapting, on the left we were adapting on the fly. Let me see if I can. We were adapting on the fly um, we were basically providing corrections to the robot um, policy, and we were doing that through touch. And that, of course, is probably not going to be an appropriate interface either. Um, we can also think about things like, what about caregiver demonstrations? Um, so are there ways to actually be able to communicate what you would like the robot to do to a caregiver, and then the caregiver can sort of like kinesthetically teach it? Um, we're not sure, but what a, a big thrust in my lab, um, this is actually the career <coughs> award that was mentioned, is that we are going to be looking at developing machine learning algorithms that expli explicitly expect this kind of data and perform well with them. <coughs> okay, the last um, bit that I'm going to talk about is using robot learning to promote human motor learning. So 
Um, the best on the right here is something that's called the Body Machine Interface. That was developed at RIC by Sandra Musa Valdi's group. Um, and this is the exception, of what to, the exception to what I said earlier about only using commercially available control interfaces. What this is is a vest of IMUs, and so it detects mo movement in like the shoulders and upper torso. So even if you have a very high spinal cord injury and are quadriplegic, lots of times there's actually a little bit of residual muscle or movement in the shoulders. And this device can actually pick that up, um, and it, what it does is it projects that higher dimensional signal that it's getting from the, this vest. So it, if you have four IMUs, that's a, six, a 36 dimensional control signal, and it projects it down to a 2D control space. So they've used this to operate a power wheelchair, which is a 2D problem, to control the position of a cursor on a screen, um, and to do things like virtual typing and pong, things like that. One of the nice things about this interface is that you have to move to use it. So in <coughs> comparison to like brain computer interfaces, you actually have to perform movements, and therefore there are potentially rehabilitation benefits to actually using the interface that you're using to operate your assistive device. And I would say that would actually probably be the gold standard for um, the kind of work we're doing in my lab is that the idea that you know, we try to he rehabilitate humans' bodies as far as we can. When there's a gap remaining, we use machines to fill in that gap. Um, we make those machines more accessible and easier to control by adding in autonomy. But ideally, if op by operating those machines, we actually could continue to move this line, that would, that would be our gold standard. Um, so what we would like to do is use this body machine interface to operate a robotic arm. We don't know if this is even gonna be possible. Like, I can think very obviously of four control dimensions to use for my own shoulders. Six, I'm not sure, would it be combinations? And I have full range of motion in my shoulders. And so I, we don't even know if humans can do this, but we're gonna help them learn. Our idea is that we're going to help them learn um, with robotics autonomy. So we can start out, for example, with the human controlling only two dimensions of that 6D control signal, um, which we already know that they are able to do that. Sandra's work has already demonstrated that. And then as they become more able and more um, capable with, uh, at operating the system, more familiar with it, we can unlock additional control dimensions. Ideally, all the way to the point where we actually don't even need the autonomy anymore. But if we can't get that far, the autonomy can sort of remain in place. And so what we really like about this idea is that we're actually using um, robot machine learning in order to elicit human motor learning, which we think would be really great if we were able to get this to work. We're still trying to get it funded <laughs> at the moment, but. Um, and this is just a proof of concept of, of the integration of the two systems. So here the body machine interface is only controlling in 2D. The two dimensions that it's controlling is the speed of the trajectory. So these are predefined trajectories. So this is a very, very simplified scenario. But a predefined trajectory um, for the robotic arm, it's piecewise trajectory. So what the human is controlling is the triggering between the pieces. So right now you're going to see him trigger to start pouring the cup. Um, and also the speed of these piecewise executions. Um, now you'll notice how big of a movement he made. That's because he uh, doesn't have any motor impairments and that shows actually um, the body machine interface actually encourages people to move within like the greatest space um, that they are able. And they do this with sort of like a, what they call a calibration dance to start out with. And then it actually is looking for the axes of greatest variance um, with it within that space. Okay. So just to recap, so I talked about these control challenges at the beginning, and um, these first three we're really addressing with autonomy. Um, and the big question there is how do you actually share control between the robot and the human? Um, I also mentioned how there are the, there's this um, issue of unique and non-static abilities. And to do that, it should, the fact that we need to be sort of, the, the fact that people have individualized preferences and also that their abilities are changing actually should come back and inform our autonomy design, right? And so the question then is, how do you actually perform this customization? Can you do it automatically? Um, and if we are able to do it automatically, where do these learning signals come from in this sort of information impoverished space that we're working with because of these control interfaces? Um, so that's it. This is my, my team, current and former members of my team and funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions. Their preferences on, or some of the major factors. 
So I'd say that, um, well, so we had a couple of different things. I think we had four different metrics that we were computing. Um, and what was particularly important is that, you know, two of those metrics were sort of standard robotics metrics. Two of those metrics were very specifically about how the human was interacting with the interface, like so what was their frequency of interaction, things like that. And those two, those two dimensions really seemed to make a difference. Um, but that, that's probably the, the best insight I can give you. Okay. It's just sort of like on the fly. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, seems like you deal a lot with, with visual impairments. Actually, we don't at all, but this would be, um, this would, this would be applicable in those domains. But, but, yeah. I was thinking of a, a C9 dog, okay? mm -hmm. and you have this grip, mm -hmm. and the C9 dog is able to get people most anywhere through mm -hmm. all kinds of difficult situations. Mm -hmm. With a very small, maybe 15, 20, you know, back up, you know, mm -hmm. go to the left, go to the right. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple, doesn't require a lot of digital facility. All mm -hmm. has to do with basically this kind of facility. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you ever thought yeah. you could electronic yeah. version of that which is a, a, so, such a simple interface and something that blind people already understand. Right. And people who are becoming blind or having visual impairments are likely to have to understand in order to use one of these animals. Right. And, and I don't know how many degrees of freedom mm -hmm. you require to have a, actually a, something to hold on to, but it mm -hmm. seems like something that already exists that you can emulate mm -hmm. electronically yeah. with you know, robotic uh, kinds of movements. Yeah, so people have uh, looked into an idea along those lines with by using haptic joysticks. So these are joysticks that actually provide like vibratory feedback right. to a person. Um, now, and and the way that it's providing the vi vi vibratory feedback is by checking for obstacles and maybe telling you how far you are, things like that. Um, I'd say that trying to figure out so, so I can think of both. Uh, both needs and not needs for uh, providing feedback like that to the human. So one thing is that like the autonomy definitely needs an idea of what you're trying to do. And so for someone who's actually fully, um, I mean, maybe you could program in like these are sort of your the paths you tend to take, but like this idea of like where that information is coming from. So the human needs to be able to provide some sort of input related to the environment or where they're trying where they're trying to go. But maybe that could just be like verbal input beforehand saying like this is the location and we use GPS. Like that would be, that's not on this system, but it would be an option. Um, then I guess another question is if the autonomy is able to like tell, to do the command, then what's the benefit for the human executing the command instead of the autonomy? And I could imagine that the human has a better idea of um, like how fast they're gonna be going and stuff like that. So I could imagine advantages for that. Or I could also imagine that um, some people would say, well, if the autonomy can do it anyways, like just do it. And so um, I could, I think, and I think again, I don't know that there would actually be a real, a, a single answer to that, right? I bet it would be personal preference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We're having some technical challenges, so we'll take another question. <laughs> We're actually not executing control at that level. So we are sending it to the proprietary wheelchair control, um, control, I mean, like box. And so, the, and there's advantages and disadvantages to that. So the advantage is that we don't need to hack into the proprietary control system at all. We just sort of port in, we emulate joystick voltages. But the disadvantage is that we can't optimize the system as a whole. And also these interface control modules actually come with somewhat of a delay, which is an issue for people just when they're driving, the chair's no autonomy. Um, for, for people, the fact that if you're using a sip and puff, there's actually this like millisecond delay that can be dangerous. You might roll out into traffic, and that's something that we have in our system all the time because we're using that port of entry. So you don't compensate for the last year we don't. I mean, there certainly are ways where we could we could try. Well, sorry. What do you mean by compensate for velocity? Like you know, the you know the effect of velocity as a as a feedback is very important in a huge situation, for example. So could I ask you guys to have this conversation offline? Yeah, already. It sounds fairly technical, and uh, we need to move ahead with our panel. So thank, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome.